Yeah, great. I got a pitch back. I'm going to have to hit the pitch on that first note in Jerusalem so I know where I'm, where I'm starting. <coughs> I'll just do that. Could you do that? That I can do. <laughs> hey, do it again for me. And did those feet. Okay, if you could do that, that'd be great. <clears throat> then at least I know what pitch to start on. I don't have perfect pitch. I can't just start. Then I'll start too low or too high. I won't be able to hit the high notes. You gotta have the first. Yeah, well, you know, when we didn't have a pianist, I would just hit the pitch pipe so I know the note. Okay, great. Come on in, everybody. Come on in. Chairs up front. Don't be shy. Come on in. Come on in. I'm going to start ringing a bell, and then eventually, the, the when it gets loud, you, just, you can stop.
morning, everybody. Okay, if you would all stand and just join some hands of the people next to you. You don't have to, don't make a circle or anything. It'd be too hard today. But if it is the rows, could join hands. I'm going to lead us in an opening prayer. Okay, if you just close your eyes for a moment and center in. Can somebody turn off the fan, please? I will. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Holy Spirit, thank you so much for bringing us all together here this morning. And help us just put aside whatever activities we may have had this morning. Our, you know, just waking up, taking a shower, getting dressed, driving, public transportation, whatever we did to get here. <clears throat> and just acknowledge that here we are. We made it. So did the coffee machine. <laughs> <laughs> Just allow the sound of the coffee machine to take you deeper <laughs> into your holy, pure selves. So we're here, Holy Spirit, we're here. And we're just ready to be open to this experience. We're ready to hear your voice speaking mm -hmm. through everything that happens, through the song, through the reading, through David's talk, through the sharing, through the walls, through the chairs, through the music, through the air. Everything can speak to us of you if we choose it. It's up to us to make that choice. Your voice is always there. And we choose this morning to amp up our willingness to listen. Amen. 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 Okay, if you're still, play, please stay standing. And, uh, you know, we don't have enough songbooks, but if you can open up, you have songbooks near your chairs, if you could open them up, you know, people are going to have to share songbooks, and if you would open to number 14, <clears throat> number 14, morning has broken, I know you think you know it, but we're going to sing all three verses, and you don't know all three verses, so, you know, you don't, I know you don't, just get a songbook and open it up. <clears throat> Okay, everybody kind of near a songbook, at least sort of. And I know, you know some of you maybe are not really familiar with church singing, but the more out-of-tune voices you have, the better <laughs> it is. Because you need all the out-of-tune voices to balance out the other out-of-tune voices. So the, the whole balance of out-of-tune voices just makes it work. So sing right out, please. Okay, and uh, we have a guest pianist here today, Chris. And Chris, if you would play the first line or phrase, then we'll join in. so well. Okay, you can, you can be seated now. 
I know some of you are, are new here. Thank you so much for, for coming today to our service. We're so happy to see you. Okay, now what we do, we are in A Course in Miracles Church, and it is a church. I know some of you get a little freaked out with that. So uh, we are in A Course in Miracles Church, and what we do now is we have a meditation based on our Course in Miracles workbook lesson of the day, and we do the lessons in the yearly sequence. So um, it's leap year, though, that kind of throws it off. But, it's, uh, but we are doing lesson number 124 today. And leading us in our meditation on the workbook lesson is our assistant minister, Reverend Kelly Halleck. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So get, get yourself comfortable. Mm. So in. Invite you to uncross your hands, your arms, your feet. Allow yourself to just settle into this moment. Take a nice deep breath and exhaling. I invite you to picture a ball of golden light in the center of your heart. That light is just spinning beautifully, gently. We are the light of the world, and the light of God shines within us, and this light represents that. And just visualize that light expanding into your torso, to the top of your head, down your arms, down your legs to the feet. So you see yourself just absorbed by this golden light. I invite you now to see that light just continuing to expand, merging with the light of the people sitting next to you, the people sitting in this room. And then that light continues to expand filling not only this space and the city, but going out to the oceans and to the world and beyond so that everything we see, everything we can imagine is just bathed in this golden light. And that light again reminds us that we are one with God Lesson says, let me remember I am one with God. We can just sit in this light, visualizing just a glimpse of what that means. I am one with God. I'm one with my neighbors. I'm one with my friends. I'm one with those I might classify not as friends but that light permeates and shows us that we are all one. And so we're able to sit in that and be grateful for all the gifts that God has given us. We forget sometimes how blessed we are. We have clean water to drink, transportation to get here. And it supports us in realizing that we are not these bodies. That we are one with our brothers. And we are one with God. And so we just sit in that gratitude. That we have all that we need. We have all that we could ever want. As the world offers nothing of value, and yet our oneness with God offers us everything we could ever want or desire. And so we say thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you for all we have.
golden light just extends throughout. It's easy to get distracted sometimes and forget that we are one. And so we just come back to that image that we are all one. And we are one with God. Sending forth the love and blessing that we are so grateful to receive. We share that with all of our brothers, with all beings. And we give thanks. Take another nice deep breath. I always like to wiggle my fingers and my toes. <laughs> and say welcome back. Mm -hmm. And I get the pleasure. We're going to do our reading. So I think, does everybody have, does anybody not have a program? If you don't have a program, wave. Got one up front. Anybody else need a program? So on the third page is going to be a reading. And we get to have the beautiful Lisa Fair is going to come up and do that. She's actually going to be joining David this afternoon in the workshop presenting. So thank you for Lisa. The concept of the self. The concept of the self has always been the great preoccupation of the world. And everyone believes that he must find the answer to the riddle of himself. <laughs> Salvation can be seen as nothing more than the escape from concepts. It does not concern itself with content of the mind, but the simple statement that it thinks. And what can, and what can think as choice and can be shown that different thoughts have different consequences. So it can learn that everything it thinks reflects the deep confusion that feels about how it was made and how it, it is. <laughs> and vaguely does the concept of, I'm going to sit down, Tony. There you go. <clears throat> And vaguely does the concept of the self appear to answer what it does not know. Seek not yourself in symbols. There can be no concept that can stand for what you are. What matters is which concept you accept while you perceive a self that interacts with evil and reacts to wicked things. Your concept of yourself will still remain quite, quite meaningless. And you will not perceive that you can interact with, your, with but yourself. To see a guilty world is but the sign your learning has been guided by the world. And you behold it as you see yourself. The concept of the self embraces all you look upon. And nothing is outside of this perception. If you can be hurt by anything, you see a picture of the secret, your secret wishes. Nothing more than this. And in your suffering of any kind, you see your own conceived, concealed desire to kill. You will make many concepts of the self as learning goes along. Each one will show the changes in your own relationships as your perception of yourself is changed. Amen. Thank you. Okay, it's time for us to sing again. <clears throat> so I ask you all to stand, <clears throat> excuse me, and turn to number 18. So I want to give a little introduction to the song. <clears throat> okay, this song is Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is generally not sung in the United States. 
It's generally sung in England and in the United Kingdom. If you've ever seen a royal wedding or a royal funeral, in fact, if you've ever seen any movie anywhere that takes place in England, you have heard Jerusalem because they sing it all the time. It's considered by some to be the national anthem of England. <clears throat> Uh, in the uh, song that they sing in England, of course, they refer to England, but we have switched that and, and changed the lyrics a little bit so that they refer to San Francisco. But what I want to talk to you about, the song is about making where you are the Holy Land. So <clears throat> Jerusalem isn't just considered the Holy Land, it's about making where you are Jerusalem because... Jesus, you will imagine Jesus is walking through here. Even though maybe we don't actually think of him as walking through San Francisco for the purpose of the song, we will think of him as walking through San Francisco and making San Francisco into Jerusalem, making San Francisco into the Holy Land. And uh, the song challenges us to be spiritual warriors and um, ride the chariots of fire and hold up your sword that's going to make you a spiritual warrior and give you the mental fight to choose right and uh, so that is it now our, our guest pianist here does not know the song so the added challenge <laughs> is that we're going to be singing an acapella <clears throat> so that's the added challenge here today so uh, but again the more out of tune voices the better I will do my best to lead us in the singing Chris will give us the first couple of notes so here we go here we go and did those feet in ancient time walk San Francisco's mountains green? And was the holy lamb of God through San Francisco's cold fog sea? And did the cow tenants divide? Shine forth upon our clouded hills, and was Jerusalem builded here among those dark egoic wills? Bring me my bow of burning gold, bring me my arrows of desire, bring me my spear. Oh, clouds unfold, bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in San Francisco's plaza. Okay, before we sit down, give some people around you a sign or a gesture of love and joy and peace and acceptance. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so you can sit, and then I'll call you back up when, when we... Can I, can I sit here? Uh, yeah, I think David is sitting there. Anyway, hi, David. Thank you. Okay, great. Again, thank you all for being here. Uh, 
I give a little introduction for our speaker. I know you all know who he is, or you probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> so I've known uh, David, and, or of David, and known David for, I don't know, 25 years, I don't know, a long time. And uh, David is uh, a great guy, and as you all know, he travels all around the country, he travels all around the world, uh, he has traveled more than any other A Course in Miracles person that I know. Uh, always bringing his message of peace and love and oneness and the profound metaphysics of A Course in Miracles uh, everywhere he goes. He's very conversant about every spiritual path. He's wonderful in mixing it all together, but always, of course, staying true to the wonderful teaching of uh, the Course. Uh, some people like to call David a mystic. I don't know that. Some people like to even say he's enlightened, and I think that's great. I don't use those particular terms myself. But I do know that he's always happy. Mm. I do know that he's always peaceful. Mm. And he exudes that happiness and peace everywhere he goes, mm. always has, never seen him off of that. Mm. So if anything or if anybody is the real deal, David Hoffmeister is the real deal. Let's give him a nice round of applause. David <laughs> Thank you for coming this morning. I see so many dear friends, old faces, new faces, and yeah, just in coming here, I could feel the the joyful celebration feeling in the air, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to celebrate, mm. and there's just the symbols all over. I just, you know, some of my friends. I think Sean came all the way from Fresno, so that's a trek. And, uh, and Bob's all the way here from New Jersey, <laughs> but he's, he's moving out here, so, uh, so it's great that we could sing that Jerusalem song together, a traditional song and of Jesus walking around San Francisco. It's very appropriate as you're coming here. It's a beautiful symbol of mine, and, uh, and then I was told that this is Harvey Milk's birthday today, oh. and just as I'm here, you know, just heard that... Ten minutes ago, as I'm here to give a sermon and a talk about laying aside the self-concept, laying aside all the concepts in our mind, then we have, Harvey was a great example of, um, of bringing up into awareness thoughts about uh, gender and sexuality. And we have so many witnesses every day, so many opportunities to let these concepts, who we believe we are, come into awareness so we can empty our mind of them and come into the beautiful I am presence, the stillness that Jesus talked about. Before Abraham was, I am. I always like the grammar of that, that statement. It's saying there's a presence, an essence, a love, a oneness that precedes time. And even though we seem to be dreaming of time and space, we have so many opportunities to let go of our identification with these self-concepts. So, Lisa was reading a section today when they asked me to give a reading. I, I picked chapter 31 from A Course in Miracles. Just the idea that it's chapter 31, you know if Jesus has preceded it with 30 chapters and he's giving you his last chapter, imagine Jesus Christ saying, okay, I've prepared you, now we're going on to 31 now, and this is important. I didn't put it in 20 or 15 or 5. I've just let it gradually build to basically sharing some statements that salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts. And for a lot of us who have studied many different spiritualities, uh, for example, Buddhism is really, the Buddha's message is emptying the mind of everything you think you think and think you know. It's, uh, that's, the, that's what the whole message is. We've heard it through the perennial wisdom, we've heard it from all the great sages and saints, and here in chapter 31, Jesus is saying the same thing that the, the saints, the prophets, the sages have said throughout the ages. Even before the time of Jesus, this was being spoken about. And the ancient Greeks called it, know thyself. It was just saying, come into that stillness, that spirit, that presence. So, what I want to talk about is also 
that chapter 31 about <coughs> emptying the mind of the self-concept and these concepts is preceding the workbook. And the workbook, that's where you roll on into after the text, is our, our laboratory, it's our practical application. Not only do we have a great pathway in the course that, that is kind of pointing to the greatness of who we truly are as a, as a perfect child of God, but it's saying now, as we empty the concepts, with the Holy Spirit's help, we're going to have a workbook of 365 lessons. How practical is that? One lesson a day. And we're even told, you know, just try not to make exceptions in the lessons and don't do more than one a day. So you may even stay with some lessons for a period of days or time. And so that's very simple. He's like giving us the how in terms of unwinding your mind, letting your mind be rinsed clean of these false concepts. The Bible had said, hold no graven images before the Lord thy God. And these concepts are just these make-believe ego ideas of trying to make a substitute identity to take the place of our God-given identity as being the Christ, the, the living Christ. So, also what I like and what I want to mention today is that we have help in terms of a, of a curriculum, we have help in terms of a workbook, one lesson a day, and we have the Comforter, we have the Christ Presence, we have the Holy Spirit. Jesus was just the manifestation, as if the Holy Spirit could, could take form, or as a, just as a demonstration, because we know the Holy Spirit is invisible, and, and we know no one will ever see the Holy Spirit, perceive the Holy Spirit, but we can tell by the effects of all the miracles, when people light up all around us, that the Holy Spirit is working in us and through us. And that's how we know that the Comforter is activated in our hearts. So, unlike a lot of great non-dual teachings from way back before the time of Jesus, and there's been many in, in India, Veda Vedanta, and China, and so forth, we're told that the Holy Spirit is, is, can work with our mind to empty our mind of these concepts. And that's what the workbook is. It's, it's a practical way of letting the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us. So we're not just left in the void. We're not just left standing in emptiness and trying for emptiness and hoping for emptiness. We actually have a teacher, a comforter, a guide there. One of the things that's so touching to me, uh, I was just, uh, Lisa and I and, and my friend uh, Gia were out with Tamara and, and Judy and Witt. We were having lunch yesterday and again as we were, a few of us were sitting in the living room, the, the story came to me that Witt had told me of his life, where, you know, he'd worked for the Department of Defense for the United States government. He had a very storied career. I think he, somebody said he was a general. I mean, he's, he's had all these things, and he was a very distinguished career. And he told the story where he was sent over with a, with a small delegation of, of uh, politicians, uh, to to go over and greet Mao Zedong, Mao in China. <laughs> so his his life spans a nice. He's about 90 years old. It spans some years, and he was going over. So the delegation goes over <coughs> to meet Mao Zedong, Mao. And when they get there, within days after they arrive, Mao dies. <laughs> uh, so now we've got this American delegation. And he was saying, well, the Chinese were very concerned now because what do we do with the American delegation? They were coming over here to meet Mao, and Mao is dead. So, basically, they were there, and they didn't know what to do with them, and there was all kinds of political infighting that started to occur. When you have a, a, character, a character like Mao, it's like, have, you know, it's probably even more uh, like rocking their whole country than even when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, because Mao had enormous influence, at least with the President. We have a Congress and, you know, House of Representatives and Senate. But Mao was like the one that everybody followed, and when he died, the they just didn't know what to do with, do with this delegation, and they, they didn't want to be embarrassed. But instead of sending them back to America, they just sent them to Tibet. <laughs> uh, kind of to hide them, <laughs> because they didn't know what to do with them. So, so Whit got sent to Tibet and just cast out on the streets wow. to survive. And imagine being an American delegation, 
if the politicians think they have it bad <laughs> with their competitors. Imagine being out in Tibet and thrown out onto the streets. What we don't know and what Witt told us was that prior to going to China, he had been diagnosed with cancer and told by the doctor he only had six months to live. And so he said yesterday, he said, I went to China because I thought, hmm, that's my, like, my last whim, you know, <laughs> before I die, to go to China and meet Mao. Oh my gosh, because he had been a politician, very big heart and everything. This was way before the Course, so there was no Course in Miracles back then. So he basically, he's there, he's been diagnosed with cancer and his health goes way down in Tibet. There's no doctors, really not medical attention, he's just out on the streets, imagine being a, a, a delegate <laughs> over there, and there he is, and he's just going down, and he's, he's dying. So as he's dying, what he does is he prays to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, thank you. I have had such a full life, with all the people I've known, and, and my friends, and my family, and all the people I got to meet, and in Washington, and all the things I've been able to do with my life, thank you, just thank you for everything. And he gives his prayer as he's, as he's dying, thank you for everything, I have such full gratitude <coughs> in Tibet. And he's like, this is good, and even a whim to go to China and meet Mao, <laughs> you know, like I made it to China. And the last part was, oh, and if there's anything else I can do for you, <laughs> uh, please, I'm your man. I'm your man. Well, Jesus pulled him out of China, <laughs> and he, he met Judy, and he has overseen translating the Course into 25 different languages, and lived on for decades. <laughs> Jesus is like that way with all of it. Oh, by, and by the way, oh, thank you for asking. <laughs> it's been a nice life and career you've had, and uh, I would love to use you in a very important way. And we know that's the most important thing. And remember, how does that fit with our sermon today? The undoing of the self-concept is Jesus, the Holy Spirit, are there to use us in helpful ways that benefit the whole universe that wake us up in a practical, step-by-step -step way. The people we're supposed to meet, the things we're supposed to do, the, the teachings we're supposed to share, the love we're supposed to share, the hugs, the happiness, the smile, the songs, the laughter, all of that has the love of Christ behind it, waking us up in a beautiful step-by-step -step way, unwinding us. There's even a movie with uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman and Lily Tomlin called I Heart Huckabees. Has anybody ever seen I Heart Huckabees? It's beautiful. They're existential <laughs> detectives helping the main characters dismantle from their perception of the world. Wow. And isn't that lovely? And isn't that funny to have Dustin Hoffman and Lily Tomlin as your instructors, as your detectives, helping you find the clues, follow the clues, and dismantle from your perception. So, to me, that's the way my life has gone. I was, I was very shy, I was most voted, voted most quiet in my senior class, I was like a, a wallflower. I shied away from everything, everyone. Um, people say, how, Gandhi was pretty shy too, how shy were you in your early days, your persona? I was so shy that I didn't go out on my first date until I was 27 years old. I was shy. Very shy. And Moses, Moses, they said, stuttered, and Moses ended up having been called on by God to deliver the Ten Commandments. A stutterer was chosen <laughs> to deliver the Ten Commandments. It's just showing that the Spirit's in charge. And even with the story of the Course, a lot of you know, you know, the Reed Erickson uh, was a transgender man living in. The, on the west coast of, I think it was Mazatlan of um, Mexico. He's the one that was inner guided to sell a piece of property to provide the $70,000 or so that was needed for the first printing of A Course in Miracles. Mm -hmm. A transgender man yeah. living on the west coast of Mexico <laughs> called in. You know, basically he'd already sold the property. 
He called in, Judy was telling us yesterday that he'd already called, sold a, had put that in motion before he even called, as they were praying, what do we do? They don't know what they're doing. She said, we didn't know what we were doing. We just were four people praying together and asking. And that was what we were told yesterday, that, that Ken said, I don't, I'm hearing nothing. And Bill said, I'm hearing nothing. Judy's just sitting quiet. And then Helen goes, Judy will hear. And Helen was the, the scribe. And then Judy heard, make the commitment first. Like, we're not going even forward, even to the publishing, until there's one important thing that all of you agree on. You need to devote your entire lives to working with this manuscript. And I know there's those in the room that have devoted their entire lives to do it, so you know what I'm talking about. It, it takes a huge dedication. But they said yes. The four said yes. And we have Judy that remains with us, and she's just here to be, to witness and tell some of the stories of all that they went through, all that we're all going through in the undoing of this false self-concept. We have so many helpers. We have helpers everywhere we look. We have helpers in this room, we have helpers everywhere. I've been blessed to go to 40 some countries and meet all the helpers that I don't even speak the language of the helpers and yet I can see their smiles, I can feel their hugs, I can feel their joy, their laughter. It's like a big symphony. We have a symphony going on to help us awaken from this dream. So to me it's extremely practical that we have a guide and I would say the whole point of A Course in Miracles is, is just to put you in touch with your own internal teacher. And we get a hint of what happens after you're really in touch with the internal teacher, then in Lesson 189 of the workbook, simply do this, be still. Some of you remember that beautiful paragraph that, that ends with, forget this world, forget this course, and come with open arms unto your God. It's basically saying, as soon as you get actively in touch with your own internal teacher, and call it whatever you want, doesn't matter what tradition, you want to call it intuition, you want to call it higher power, higher self, Holy Spirit, it doesn't really matter. As soon as you're in touch with that, then you have got to that point with the Course where it's given you a good launch. Somebody was saying to me the other day on, on Skype, you know, you know, why are you still affiliated with the Course in Miracles? And, and I said, well, I, I just have such a gratitude for it, but I wouldn't say I don't like chain it to my arm and I don't like, I did in the early years, I carried it around, I didn't chain it to my arm, but I didn't really set it down very much, I, I take it to bed. But actually you do reach a point where you get so in touch with your internal teacher that you're meant to be done through, while you still believe there's a doer, the Holy Spirit will use the doer concept. Something Tony's been good at emphasizing, you know, listen, to my voice, learn of, of me, learn of my curriculum, and, and do what is asked of you, you know. And that doing component is something not to be ignored, because we are meant to be done through by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We're not meant to try to avoid that and just om and, and hope that our alming will reach God. That, Jesus does even mention that, that meditation, long periods of meditation, fighting against sin, contemplation, those means will succeed as well. But they're tedious and time consuming. I don't know about you, but I'm happy to hear my teacher tell me when something's tedious and time consuming. I'm not so drawn <laughs> to that as much anymore. I'm more interested in holy relationship. I'm more interested in seeing the Christ in everyone I meet. I'm more interested in, in practicing with every moment this curriculum, this opportunity. So that's what this afternoon is going to be. <coughs> I'm going to do a, a workshop. Lisa's, who you heard, is, is here with me as well. And we're going to talk from probably about 1.15 till 5 and maybe take a break in between, but just about our experiences on this journey of being guided by the Holy Spirit, just like with WIT, what we did, what we felt, what, what seemed to happen to us, the people we met, all those important things, just as a witness for giving all glory to God. This is a witness that 
it is possible to follow, to listen and to follow and do and come into that state of mind. And then, and also Tony has invited us here and, and uh, there's some books too that have come through me over the years. People ask me about books. I don't actually write books. Sometimes I get introduced as an author and I guess that's just because if there's a book that gets associated with your name, then suddenly you're an author. Although the Course is teaching us that God is the author of reality and there are no other authors but God. So actually, that's a beautiful thing that I realized. So, but that, I don't actually ever sit down to write a book. I just give talks. They get recorded and then they get transcribed and then they get put in a book form and other forms and that's just what happens. I just get to watch. But basically I don't ever have an intention to start to write a book or start to do anything. I think the greatest characteristic of, of this undoing is that miracles are involuntary. They should not be under conscious control. So to me, you can tell you're really being used by the Holy Spirit when you're having a joyful, exciting, fun time, fun experience, and something seems to be happening but you have no clue of what it is. You have no clue of where it's going in form. You have no plan even for what's happening. You're very childlike, like in childlike wonder, appreciating everything. And that's why I enjoy invitations to come out and give a talk like this, because I get to hear it for the first time, like all of you. <laughs> we all are hearing it for the first time. And there's no other time that will be repeated. Uh, it, it may come in all kinds of different appearances. Like there's many flowers in the world and fragrances in the world, there's many ways that the Spirit uses us. So, I hope that you will stay if you have the opportunity this afternoon. It will be very interactive as well, because that's generally what I do. I don't even give sermons, but apparently this is a sermon. That's what it is. <laughs> it's called a sermon. <laughs> because we're in a church. <laughs> and you speak for so much time. So, how are we doing? Is that pretty good on time? I'm not timing you. You're not timing me today. I don't really know, but <laughs> you feel that good on time it is? Very good. Well, I thank you all for coming, and I, I love you all. I hope I get a chance to hug all of you after the service, and I just love you so dearly, and I'm so grateful that you're giving your life to God for this most holy purpose. Mm. And I know that you will experience the happiness that comes from that function and that devotion, as I have, and as I continue to experience. So, thank you, and God bless you. That's right. That's right. Discussion. <laughs> we discuss here. I love that. Okay. In, as they do at the Community Miracle Center, we open it up for, I think it's discussion, feedback, sharing miracles, questions, anything. It's just a wide open 10 minute discussion that comes after the sermon. Oh, well. Right now. Right. Um, this, I love the letting go of the self concept and you know that line where it said that whatever is happening in the world, I chose it to happen because I want to die or I want death or I'm worshipping death and something like that. And when you ask, tell, when you tell God, I'll do whatever you want. I'll do whatever you want. Then you just better watch out. Because, <laughs> because I get to forgive these, and you call them concepts, I call them these entrenched beliefs. These entrenched beliefs that my identity and my, that, well, one, betrayal, possessiveness, um, jealousy. Those three beliefs are pretty entrenched, and they were even more entrenched in my family because of my mother's story. And I'm watching how I took her story and made it my story. And but then I'm looking at well, what's the purpose? What's the holy purpose of this? And the holy purpose is for me to look at it differently and show that story differently to the world through the eyes of forgiveness. 
But that doesn't mean that my humanity's butt isn't being kicked a bit while I let go of possessiveness, jealousy, and betrayal, because entrenched beliefs that are drilled into you by family and society, and that they're, they're the death of the ego. And the ego doesn't want to go down quietly. It wants to make sure that it's like, but wait a minute, but, but wait, but what about this? What about this part of the belief? What about this? What about this piece? You can't let go of all, you can let go of all the betrayal, but what about this piece of the betrayal? Or what about this part? And what about this thing? And as I watch my ego do this, it's like, it just wants to be right so bad. And, and, and I like being right. There's a part of me that wants to be, that my ego just wants to be so right. And that's how I wrote my story. I wrote my victim story so I could be right. Yeah. And I and I I wrote it, I and and it's not that pretty when you look at it like that. It's like I wrote this story exactly as it's playing out, so my ego could be right. You know, when you're talking, the part that Lisa read today from chapter 31, the most exciting part of the whole reading to me is the the last part. It says, "You will make many concepts of the self as learning goes along." Each one will show the changes in your own relationships as your perception of yourself has changed. When I first read the Course, and I got to that line in the Course, I just stopped in my tracks and I went, how fascinating. Mm -hmm. You will make many concepts of the self as learning goes along. In other words, the tablecloth is not going to get ripped out like in the magicians, you know, with all the silverware and the candles and the plates and the forks, and, and then boom, it's going to be a systematic, guided by the Holy Spirit, exchanging of self-concepts. He even says that in that section, where you keep exchanging, exchanging. And, and if we honestly look at our experience in the world, hasn't it gone that way? We are not the same people that we believe. We don't have the same relationships that we had when we were children or adolescents or young adults. We are going through a systematic shifting of self-concepts. Yeah, they're all still self-concepts. Uh, and the Course even goes so far, you know, to say that salvation is escape from concepts. So we do know where this is headed. And the ego d interprets that as annihilation. Like, oh, the big zero. I thought I was coming in here to make something in my life, achieve, and accumulate, and possess, and have love relationships, and all these things. Abandonment, jealousy, rage, everything came with that, and now we're being unwound. And that's what the book that I have called Unwind Your Mind Back to God. Again, I never, I never set off to write a book, so I just made a website and put it out there for free for everybody to read. And then eventually the Spirit said, well, some people liked it in book form, so it got turned into a book. But it was actually a website that turned into a book. It's actually three books in one. But it's the how. And now they're starting to be, of course there's course groups all over the world, but I know here in the Bay Area there's an Unwind Your Mind Back to God group that actually work with that book because it shows the tracing back into the thoughts of what I'm still holding on to. And sometimes you need an example of, of, you need some witnesses that that can actually be done. And you can actually learn with your brothers and sisters. So thank you for that. And I also think if we simplify it real quickly, that I love, you know, Lesson 71, only God's plan for salvation will work. And basically, I love that lesson because he's saying, basically, the ego is the belief that if something other than my mind would change, something in the world, somebody looked differently, acted differently, behaved differently, if something, anything at all in the world would change, I would be happy. And that's the ego. The ego does have a plan for salvation. It's not just like a puff of nothingness that's, that's sitting back. No, it actively has a plan for you to save yourself from all the unhappiness and misery. If something in the world would change, other than my mind, that's the one thing. <laughs> other than my mind, if something else in the world would change, I would be happy. And that also is a plan of holding grievances. It tells you that you can hold grievances and achieve salvation. <laughs> and the, the Holy Spirit's plan is the exact opposite of that. No, you have to let go of every scrap and grievance. So, thank you, Roxy. Yes. <coughs> David, thank you so much for your talk, and it's uh, 
It's great to see you. You look fabulous up there, I want you to know. Uh, with the light back of you. So, thank you. And th thank you for mentioning, um, and I, I really appreciate that, that you've actually heard it, uh, the, the listen, learn, and do thing, because uh, it's, it's an important thing for me, <clears throat> just to keep putting out there, that the Holy Spirit has plans for us, uh, and for things that we can do, and especially the story you told about with. Uh, when he really surrendered to that and opened himself up to be used in ways and, and for doings to be done through him, it actually healed him. So um, I think it's a real important message uh, for us to get from A Course in Miracles that uh, the Holy Spirit will use us. And, and you can't know in advance what that's going to look like. Uh, I, I'm sure Witt didn't think it was going to look like it did for him. But here it is now, what, uh, 40 or 50 years after that time. I don't know when Ma was. Uh, and, uh, and, and he's, you know, he's, he's still doing what uh, Holy Spirit guided him to do. So uh, I really do, uh, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. It's been a real blessing. And it's, it's such a dear purpose that we share. It's such a holy purpose. And, and I think you can feel that, and I hope that you can keep that lit in your heart, that precious holiness, because that's what carries us. Yeah. Blessings. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.